Why Catholic is made possible by generous patrons. If you're blessed by this podcast, consider supporting it by purchasing something from the Why Catholic merch shop on Etsy. Link is in the show notes. Original designs on sweatshirts, t-shirts, hats, decals, and more. Stay tuned to the end of this episode to hear how you can get a special discount. Thanks for supporting Why Catholic. If you've ever sat in the outfield in a Major League Baseball game, you may have noticed a phenomenon where you see the batter hit the ball before you hear the sound of the ball hitting the bat. It's simple physics, really. Light travels at nearly 300 million meters per second, whereas sound travels 343-ish meters per second, give or take a few meters depending on the weather conditions. If you're familiar with miles, then this might be a little bit more meaningful to you. Light travels at 186,000 miles in one second, while sound takes almost five seconds to travel one mile. So even if you're in a stadium about 400 feet from the batter, you will see him hit the ball before you will hear the sound of the ball hitting the bat, because light travels much faster than sound. Simple physics would also inform us that for the person sitting behind home plate, the sight and sound of the ball hitting the bat will be nearly simultaneous since they are sitting mere feet away from the action. In fact, if you think about it, a person sitting in the outfield will actually see the bat hitting the ball after the person sitting behind home plate. Light travels so fast that the difference in time will be perhaps hundreds of thousandths of a second. But physics tells us that it takes time for light to travel. And so logically, it takes longer for the image to travel to the person in the outfield 400 feet away than it does to the person 50 feet away. When we increase the distance between an object and its observers, we find even greater discrepancy in time. For example, on May 19th, 2023, a supernova named SN 2023IXF was observed in the Pinwheel Galaxy. For those unfamiliar with the term, a supernova is an exploding star. That supernova is estimated to be 21 million light years away. That means that the supernova we are observing actually occurred 21 million years ago. It's just taken 21 million years for the light to travel to Earth, allowing us to observe something that happened a long, long time ago. What we must understand, thanks to physicists like Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein, is that the speed of light is constant. In fact, it is the fastest known thing in the universe. Nothing we know of travels faster than the speed of light. However, there is something that is not constant, and that is time. And when we understand this, we are closer to understanding the metaphysics of a personal God. Hi, this is Justin Hibbert, and you're listening to Why Catholic, my podcast about the what and why of Catholicism. In episode 83, we began a series on the nature of God, looking at his personal relationship as Trinity and Redeemer, and then we looked at the myriad of ways he expresses himself. And today, I'd like us to put on our thinking caps and explore a God who supersedes the laws of science. To begin, I'd like to once again revisit our old friend C.S. Lewis in his book Mere Christianity, particularly the chapter entitled Time and Beyond Time. In this chapter, Mr. Lewis points out that he struggled with believing in God because he could not understand how a being could not only hear but address the millions of prayers at any given moment. Or if we ask it a little differently, how can God be personal to me at the same time that he is being personal to you and to billions of other people on this earth? C.S. Lewis answers that question this way, quote, If you picture time as a straight line along which we have to travel, then you must picture God as the whole page on which the line is drawn. We come to the parts of the line one by one. We have to leave A behind before we get to B and cannot reach C until we leave B behind. God from above or outside or all around contains the whole line and sees it all, end quote. If I could go back in time and arrange a meeting, it would be with C.S. Lewis and Albert Einstein. And I'd say, I want you to flesh out this idea of God beyond time and give a presentation on it. Mr. Lewis, I'd like for you to start with the theology of the matter. And Mr. Einstein, I'd like for you to take Mr. Lewis's theology and explain the physics of it. Turn it into an equation of sorts. I'd imagine the equation that Albert Einstein might begin with is E equals mc squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, one of the most famous equations in all of physics. When I think about this equation, I'm struck by something in the story of creation in the book of Genesis. 
When I was growing up, there were lots of people in my circles that were convinced that the creation story in the Bible should be taken literally, meaning we ought to believe that creation happened exactly as the Bible states, that God created the entire universe and all living things in six 24-hour time periods. But when we think like that, we miss a giant clue, something I dare say Albert Einstein would have noticed if he were reading the book of Genesis. God didn't begin creation by creating time. He began by creating light. And what is light? It's both a particle and a wave. And more importantly for this lesson, it's the fastest known thing in our universe. We might put it this way. God began his design of the universe by creating the universe's speed limit, 300 million meters per second. Why is that important? It's because light is a constant, whereas time is relative. This was the premise of Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. What Einstein proposed, and subsequent experiments have shown, is that the closer we travel to the speed of light, the slower we experience time relative to someone, say, on Earth. We wouldn't notice that time has slowed down. It would seem normal to us. But if we were to set two atomic clocks, one on Earth and one on our spaceship that was traveling at a very, very, very fast speed, we would notice that the two atomic clocks ticked at a different rate. Furthermore, gravity also affects time. The heavier the gravity, the slower the time. In fact, a 2022 study measured time dilation at the smallest scale ever, showing that two tiny clocks in the same cloud of atoms separated by just a millimeter or the width of a sharp pencil tip tick at different rates. I've linked to an article about it in the show notes. This means that an atomic clock at the top of Mount Everest will tick at a different rate than a clock at sea level because the gravitational field is different. It also means that an atomic clock on a supersonic jet will tick slower than a stationary atomic clock on Earth because the supersonic plane is traveling closer to the speed of light than a stationary clock. However, a supersonic plane traveling at, say, Mach 2 is only traveling at about 686 meters per second or around 1,500 miles per hour. That's hardly the speed of light, which is nearly 300 million meters per second or 186,000 miles per second. So as we might expect, while the atomic clocks will tick at different rates, the difference between them will be minuscule. What if we were to travel to, say, a planet near a black hole with an enormous gravitational field? How might that amplify time dilation? This is illustrated in one of my favorite movies, the 2014 film Interstellar starring Matthew McConaughey and Anne Hathaway. The premise of the movie is that Earth is dying of famine, and NASA has launched a mission to find a new habitable planet. The space crew, led by Cooper, played by Matthew McConaughey, travel to various planets where other astronauts have already landed in hopes of researching a habitable new home for the population of Earth. In one segment of the movie, the spaceship nears what they call Miller's planet because the astronaut Miller had previously landed there and a beacon from Miller's ship had been transmitting to Cooper and his crew aboard their spaceship. They want to go and rescue Miller and retrieve her data, but they have a dilemma. Due to the increased gravity on the planet, every hour they spend on Miller's planet will equal seven years on Earth. If they stay there for just hours, all of Cooper's family, whom he's trying to save, will have died by then. So the crew agree to send three astronauts on a small ship down to Miller's planet while one astronaut stays back on the mothership orbiting around Miller's planet. They calculate that they will be on Miller's planet for the briefest amount of time. However, on the mothership for the astronaut staying behind, they calculate that two years will pass. Due to harsh conditions on Miller's planet, it takes Cooper and the other two longer than anticipated to get in and out. When they arrive back to the mothership, they discover that their fellow astronaut has aged 23 years instead of just two. When Cooper gets back to the mothership, he discovers a backlog of messages from Earth. To him on Miller's planet, it felt like such a short amount of time, but for everyone else, time moved much quicker. This is called time dilation. Time is relative. How we perceive time remains the same, but when we compare time on different gravitational fields or traveling at different speeds, we discover that time has moved at a different pace. The Bible often uses light as a euphemism for God. Isaiah 9's prophecy about the Messiah says, quote, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. End quote. In John's preamble to his gospel, he says in John 1, 4 through 5, quote, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. End quote. 
God oftentimes reveals himself in some sort of form of light, like the Shekinah glory that led the Hebrews through the wilderness or the transfiguration. But it is not merely enough to call God light, because if God created light, then he outshines light, so to speak. If light is the universe's speed limit, then to say that God is bound by his speed limit would be like saying God created a rock that was even too heavy for him to pick up. Even light, the fastest known thing in our universe, is no match for God. So by the very nature of physics, we can certainly conclude that God does not experience time at the same rate as us. If he can adjust his speeds, if he can move at the speed of light, then time can move quite slowly for God in comparison to us. I think this was one of the remarkable revelations I had when I became Catholic. God plays the long game. I think we can be tempted to think that, depending on the crisis, the church is on the verge of extinction. For us, it may feel that way, but picture it from God's vantage point. Picture what it must be like for 10 years to pass by for us, but only a day for God. St. Peter says as much. 2 Peter 3.8 says, quote, But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, end quote. This leads us to another remarkable aspect of God. If God is not bound by our universal speed limit, then this means that he can travel faster than the speed of light. And if he can travel faster than the speed of light, then this means that he can travel throughout time, even backwards in time. I've included an excellent video in the show notes which demonstrates the physics equations of time travel. Essentially, the difference in space-time divided by the change of time equals the speed of light. That's a fancy way of saying that if we could travel faster than the speed of light, then we could travel back in time. Of course, this is impossible for us as we are bound to the universal speed limit and we have yet to devise a way of traveling even remotely close to the speed of light. But God who created the universe's speed limit is not bound by such constraints. I often think about this question, can we pray for our younger selves, or can we pray for something or someone in the past? And when I think about God time traveling, I think the answer is yes, but I also have to recognize that I'm still thinking about time linearly. I need to think about it as C.S. Lewis thinks about it. God is beyond time. For us, we think of time as past, present, and future. The present moment is the shortest of the three for us. It lasts for a moment, and then it becomes the past. What if the present moment for God is eternity? What if eternity meant that there was no such thing as past, present, and future? Everything we experience or have experienced or will experience is all in this present moment of singularity. It's mind-boggling to think about because from the very moment of our existence, we have experienced light and gravity, both of which are inextricably linked to time. And if God is the creator of both light and gravity, then he transcends both, and thus he transcends time. So to the question, how can God attend to all of the prayers of the billions of people on earth? The answer is, he's not constrained by time in the way that we are. He doesn't experience time linearly. We may be in a hurry for God to answer our prayer because the moment is about to pass us, but perhaps God is experiencing all of it in the present moment. This is what is so compelling about Catholicism. We believe that there aren't lots of masses being said around the world. We believe there is only one. There is only one mass. Mass isn't just what's taking place in a church. It is the Lord's Supper, the crucifixion, and the marriage supper of the Lamb, all wrapped up into a single moment, a present moment. Many Protestants often accuse Catholics of re-sacrificing Jesus in the Mass. This is one of those instances where the limits of one's experience and thus the limits of their language are unfairly imposed onto another worldview. This is what I talked about in episode 2 called The Language of Catholicism. No, rather, we believe that the Catholic Mass is participating in eternity where there is no past, present, or future, but only the present. I might add that this has always been the Catholic belief, even long before we had the physics equations to help make sense of it. This injection of eternity into a time frame is what separates Christianity from deism. Deism is a belief that God created the universe and just left it alone. A deist would agree with most everything said in this episode about the nature of God and how he supersedes light and gravity and thus experiences time differently than us. But where Christianity differs on universal proportions is the fact that we believe God not only supersedes our dimensions of time and space, but he injects himself at just the right moment within our temporal time frame. 
Have you experienced what I would call a God moment, where at just the right time, there was some seemingly supernatural intervention? Maybe you were walking down the side of the road and something caught your eye and you stooped down to take notice of it. A moment later, a car swerved right in front of you. Had you kept walking, that car would have hit you. Or how about a time when you were suffering financially and after a season of praying for God's provision, you opened the mail only to find an unexpected sum of money? Where I went to college, there was a situation where the women's soccer team's bus broke down on the side of the road. The girls decided to get out of the bus and play, and there was this freak accident where a girl fell over and a stick got lodged into her ear. They took her to the ER, and they discovered that she had the early stage of a tumor, and they were able to intervene because they caught it early. And they caught it early because of this freak accident where a stick got lodged into her ear. This is what makes God personal. He can intervene in our timeline at just the right moment. He may not experience time linearly, but he knows that we do. He's not like an astronaut on another planet that is operating solely within his time frame. He is acutely aware of our time constraints. There's been various efforts to try and scientifically make sense of some of the biblical miracles. For example, the 10 plagues in Egypt. Scientists have noted that the now turning to blood, the first plague, could actually be an overabundance of red algae which would have poisoned the water and triggered a series of infestations of frogs, then gnats, then dead livestock, and so on and so forth. Or scientists have proposed a theory that it was likely an earthquake that shook loose dirt cliffs upriver, causing the Jordan River to dam long enough for the Jewish people to cross. In fact, in 1927, it happened at the very spot where the Bible says it happened. I've included a link in the show notes. This doesn't make these miracles any less miraculous. If anything, it demonstrates the personal nature of God to intervene perfectly. If the Jordan River earthquake theory is correct, then God not only knew of the pending earthquake, but he communicated the exact instructions and timing to the Jewish people. And just as the priests holding the Ark of the Covenant stepped into the river, the water receded and the Jewish people walked on dry ground. Christianity doesn't just claim to believe in a personal God, we believe in a super personal God. It isn't just that God has the awareness, the ability, and the care to intervene in our world and in our space-time. He injects his very self into our time and space. We call this the incarnation. And as Galatians 4, 4 through 5 states, quote, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children, end quote. The miracle of the incarnation is linked to time. As C.S. Lewis noted in his essay, Myth Became Fact, quote, Now as myth transcends thought, incarnation transcends myth. The heart of Christianity is a myth, which is also a fact. The old myth of the dying God without ceasing to be myth comes down from the heaven of legend and imagination to the earth of history. It happens at a particular date, in a particular place, followed by definable historical consequences, end quote. And not only that, but as theologians such as Father Joshua Eel point out, the timing of the arrival of the Messiah was perfect and ingenious, just as the timing of the crossing of the Jordan River was perfect and ingenious. I've linked to a video in the show notes of Father Eel explaining this. I began this episode by talking about the difference between the speed of light and the speed of sound. And I want to come back to this point because it's incredibly pertinent to the point about a personal God. On a number of occasions in scripture, we read about these phenomenological events where there is both a theophany of sorts, meaning a physical manifestation of the presence of God, accompanied by an audible voice. For example, at Jesus' baptism, it says, The heavens open, and then God the Father said, This is my Son, with whom I am well pleased. If God or if heaven is physically far away, then we should reason that we would see some sort of phenomena and then much later hear that phenomena because light travels much faster than sound. But what we see in scripture is a simultaneous injection of both some sort of sight as well as sound. If you've experienced a thunderstorm, you know that when you see lightning and then immediately hear thunder, then the lightning is very close. But if you see lightning and then hear thunder some seconds later, then the storm is some distance away. And this is an important fact about this personal God. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Therefore, it isn't in some adjacent universe or distant galaxy, but rather it is here, operating both beyond our space-time as well as inside of it. 
Thank you for joining me for Why Catholic. Be sure to subscribe to Why Catholic wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also subscribe to my Substack site and get the next episode in your email inbox. As a subscriber, you get a special discount code to the Why Catholic Etsy store. If you've been blessed by this podcast and you're feeling generous, there's also a way to financially support it, and patrons get some extra perks. To become a free subscriber or a patron, just go to whycatholic.substack.com slash subscribe. Also join me on Instagram at whycatholicpodcast, all one word. Thanks again for listening. My name is Justin Hibbard, and this is Why Catholic. God bless you.